Take it away, guys. So, so uh, thank you, thank you uh, for that. And uh, so, after this uh, discussion, which is, is not actually a panel discussion so much as a couple of talks, and then we'll answer some questions at the end, there will be a showing of the theory of everything, which is the uh, um, the Oscar-winning film starring Eddie Redmayne uh, uh, about the life and times of uh, Stephen Hawking, who uh, I'm sure you're all aware uh, died. Uh, in March this year, and um, I'm, I'm sure you've all uh, heard of Stephen Hawking, but most of what you will have seen of him is his sort of public persona uh, in The Simpsons, in uh, The Big Bang Theory, in Star Trek, and things like that. But perhaps you don't, you, you obviously have heard that he's a, he's a great scientist, but you perhaps you don't know exactly what he did. So what we decided to do as part of this, this discussion is to talk about uh, two of his uh, uh, biggest um, uh, scientific uh, discoveries. Uh, and so both uh, Toby and I had the uh, great pleasure to uh, be in his uh, research group in Cambridge uh, in, the early, in the late 1990s and uh, start of this century, which makes us sound a lot older than we actually are. Um, <laughs> Uh, um, and uh, so, so the way that we're going to do this is that we're going we're gonna to start with a clip from The Theory of Everything, just to sort of, uh, for, for those who've seen the film, to sort of try and put you in orientation for what we're actually going to talk about. And, and in that clip, he, he outlines some, there's, there's some discussion of black holes, and there's also some discussion of the Big Bang. So initially, what's going to happen is that uh, Toby will talk about black holes and Hawking radiation, and I will talk about uh, uh, the Big Bang singularity. So one thing that we wanted to emphasize in, in, in this is that Stephen actually remained scientifically active right up to the end of his life. Uh, we all know that he was, uh, became disabled with motor neurone disease. He was diagnosed in, in 1963 and he lived with it for 50 years and remained scientifically active up to, up to last year when he died, um, age uh, 76. So this is the, the clip that we're going to, so we're going to play this for a, a couple of minutes. And this is a clip. Uh, and the person who is uh, at the board there is a guy called Roger Penrose. He's the guy in the picture there. And well, for those of you who've seen the film, you perhaps remember what happens, but I mean, how do I start it, Toby? Do I just click? Just, yeah, just one more. Not that way. Yeah. Oh. Oh. That's it. No, no. All right, we didn't, we didn't. All right, is it going to start? OK, here we go. Star, more than three times the size of our sun, or to end its life, with a collapse. The gravitational forces of the entire mass overcoming the electromagnetic forces of individual atoms and so collapsing inwards. If the star is massive enough, it will continue this collapse, creating a black hole, where the warping of space-time is so great that nothing can escape, not even light. It gets smaller, smaller. The star, in fact, gets denser as atoms, even subatomic particles, get literally crushed into small and small space. And at its end point, what are we left with? A space-time singularity. Space and time come to a stop. Okay, so that is the, the clip that, it, to some degree, sets the context for the, for the discussion that we're going to make. Uh, so now, um, well, in the in next 15 minutes, Toby's going to talk about black holes, and then I will return to this uh, singularity from cosmology. Okay. So hi, everyone. So I'm Toby Wiseman. I'm a professor in Imperial College, actually, not Cambridge. Um, and as Richard was saying, we were both in Cambridge 
uh, a number of years ago, and fortunate enough to be in Stephen Hawking's research group. Since then, I mean, at the time, he was incredibly famous because of a brief history of time, obviously, and as a physicist or a, someone doing their PhD, he was incredibly famous as a scientist. And actually, what's been really remarkable is how over the last 20 years or so, he's transcended that and become probably more than even a celebrity. I mean, he's known all over the world by essentially people who have very little contact with science day to day. And seeing that incredible transcendence is uh, really remarkable. Now, of course, a lot of people wonder how good a scientist was he? Because as a popularizer of science, he was brilliant and one of the first and one of the, the best there's been. Um, and clearly his personal circumstances were very remarkable in their own right. But one of the things I think we want to emphasize in this talk is that as a scientist, so even 30 years ago, he was really uh, one of the top scientists in his generation. So he's not just famous, although he could rightly be famous simply for his popularization of science. The Brief History of Time is a brilliant book and has clearly had an enormous impact. But in fact, the science he did is really why, from our point of view, he, he should be, or will probably be, remembered. And that's really what we want to talk about here. I thought, uh, you know, a lot, lots of people have, have asked, it, you know, how good a scientist is he? And then I thought, maybe you can ca characterize really famous scientists, not, not scientists like myself and Richard, but the sort of scientists who will be remembered, say, in 100 years' time or 200 years' time. I'm pretty sure I won't be, and maybe Richard will be, but uh, we'll see. Uh, well, we won't see, but uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe some of the younger members might. There are various varieties of scientists. There's the scientists Newton, Einstein, who you've all heard of, I'm sure, Schrodinger, Heisenberg, the people who invented entirely new paradigms in physics. These are the people who didn't come up with uh, a sort of uh, a theory, but instead wrote the language that you describe your theories in. Newton basically showed how to describe the mathematics, well, the universe in terms of mathematics. Um, Einstein described how to think about space-time and completely revolutionized our, our ideas of space-time. Schrodinger, Heisenberg, uh, Schrodinger is there at the top, completely revolutionized how we think about mechanics or motion of objects. Newton started that off, but it was completed by those people in quantum mechanics. When things are small, Newton's not the right way to think about it. Really, you've got to do quantum mechanics. They're the paradigm shifters, and they'll be remembered probably for millennia. Then there's just the regular Nobel Prize winning fabulous physicists, Marie Curie, Dirac, Feynman, many of whom, many or more who you will have heard of, they just did brilliant science. They've changed our world, but they didn't rewrite the, 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 the most fundamental, the language of physics, if you like. And in some sense, I guess it's important to point out that Stephen Hawking was not one of this very small number of paradigm-changing scientist. That's not what he did. He's certainly in this category. We'll discuss why he didn't get a Nobel Prize later. But there's another category of physicists who you might overlook, but they're the ones who come up with the stepping stone to the next paradigm. And their work is brilliant, but is so important because from it stems the new really big revolution, quantum mechanics, or Einstein's theory. People like Planck and Bohr were the people who got the stepping stones, the paradoxes or problems that led to the new paradigm of quantum mechanics. And actually, Stephen Hawking is in that category. So he's not quite up there with Newton and Einstein, which is, you know, and there's a handful of scientists in the history of humanity like that. But he's really, uh, he's, he's definitely one of these stepping stone people. So he's a very important uh, scientist. You, some of you may watch this film after us, The Theory of Everything. So what is a theory of everything? When, when uh, someone like Stephen Hawking wrote in A Brief History of Time about the unified theory or theory of everything, what he was really talking about was the fact that there are two streams or paradigms in physics. There's Einstein's theory, a theory of gravity in terms of space and time. And it's called general relativity, and we'll discuss it a little bit later. 
And there's also quantum mechanics, which is really our theory of matter, how particles behave. Now, these two streams are brilliant. They do very well. Einstein tells us about cosmology, astrophysics. Quantum mechanics tells us about particle, particle physics, what happens in LHC at CERN and so on. But one of the biggest challenges, and it's nearly 100 years old now, and we're still thinking about it, is how to combine these two paradigms. How do you make space and time quantum mechanical? That's the theory of everything. And Stephen really was one of the pioneers in thinking about the theory of everything. And the stepping stone, this paradox he came up with, which we'll talk about shortly, that probably he'll be remembered for for a long time, was the stepping stone in how to get to this theory of everything. That's probably the most significant thing in his work. I was very fortunate to go to um, a beautiful event at Westminster Abbey where his remains were interred uh, there next to Newton. You can go and see this uh, very nice carved stone which lays above his remains. And on it, this is a depiction of a black hole. Black holes are difficult to depict. I think they're even harder if you're working with stone. Uh, I've not tried. Um, and here, you can see a formula. And this, in a sense, is what, well, this is what Stephen wanted on his tombstone. Um, and I'm going to describe what this is. But this probably is, the, in a sense, his most significant contribution. And it's all about black holes, as we've said. Stephen led a revolution in our understanding of black holes through the 60s and 70s. So, I mean, sometimes we forget how old he was. I mean, he was 76, and he was active and came up with his big breakthroughs right in his 20s. So he was active over a tremendously long time, but in this period, he revolutionized black holes. And he did three things. Well, he did more than three things, but three significant things we're going to talk about. Firstly, he showed with some collaborators that black holes have no hair. Now, it's an odd turn of phrase, not coined by Stephen, coined by an American scientist. But what, he, what it basically means, what it means to say is that black holes, when you look at a black hole, it's a very simple object, a bit like a, a bald head. If you try and describe a head with hair and get all the hair right, it's very complicated. The hair, hair is complicated. My hair's complicated. You know, hair, as we all know, is complicated. If you want to describe every strand, it's, it's very difficult. And if you look at something like the Earth, it's a very complicated object. There's a lot of detail there. But black holes are not like that. Surprisingly, black holes are incredibly simple. If you just know how heavy they are, how much mass they have, and how they rotate, that's everything to know. There's nothing more to know, a bit like a bald head. He also showed that stuff can come out of a black hole. Of course, you know that stuff falls in, and you probably thought quite reasonably from all the discussion that nothing can come out. Now, in fact, Stephen showed that's not quite true when you think about quantum mechanics. And this leads to this information paradox that we'll talk about. That's this stepping stone to the sort of hopeful new paradigm that we'll maybe one day have. So there's Einstein. Einstein showed re really remarkably just over 100 years ago that space and time are dynamical. They're not fixed. They bend and they warp in response to the matter that moves within them. Gravity is the result of this. Very remarkable. Newton's force of gravity is approximately right, but it's not really right in detail. And in fact, gravity is really due to a big planet like the sun bending space and time around it. And then an orbit, say, of the Earth around the sun is actually due to the fact it's moving in this warped space time. And there's a nice demo actually out there that you can find more about this as a sort of trampoline-like object that you can have a look at later. But if you bend space-time too much, it basically breaks, it tears, and that's what a black hole is. The singularity in a black hole is like a tear in space-time. The inside and outside are separated by what's called the event horizon. I'm sure you've all heard this term. From outside, actually, it's perfectly fine. You know, there's nothing to fear from a black hole as long as you've got a rocket that's powerful enough. Um, or you're not too near. It's just like a dense object. It attracts you uh, to it, but you can orbit around it just like we orbit around the sun. There's no problem there. However, of course, if you fall inside the event horizon, which is, is like a sphere in space, it's the point of no return, and then things don't go so well. And an analogy is, um, I like is, is, a, is a waterfall. A river coming up to a waterfall, it gets shallower 
And so the river gets faster up towards the lip of the waterfall. If you're a duck swimming upstream where it's slow and you travel at duck speed, you're completely fine. Um, there's no problem unless you cross a sort of invisible line where the river starts going faster than duck speed. Right? And once the river has gone faster than duck speed, that's, uh, there's no more duck. Okay. So a black hole's a bit like that. If you go inside a black hole, if it's a big black hole like a supermassive black hole, you wouldn't even know when you'd gone inside the event horizon until about an hour later when you would discover that the space around you was like a collapsing universe and your future would consist of the reverse of a big bang. Okay. They were discovered, you know, the first black holes were discovered very early, but they were viewed as a mathematical curiosity. This Penrose again, who was in that film clip from the video with the guy at the blackboard speaking, in fact, did very important work in the 60s showing that black holes aren't a curiosity of mathematics. If you believe Einstein's theory, they must be there. When star certain stars that are massive enough collapse, they will inevitab inevitably form black holes. Um, and so this was a very important result mathematically. Of course, people are skeptical. And actually, it's only in the last few years that we can be absolutely certain that there are black holes through gravitational uh, wave detections, where we've really seen now black holes rotating and merging to form a bigger black hole. That's actually been seen sort of directly. But until then, there was lots of indirect evidence, but one couldn't see them. So let's come to Stephen's contributions. Firstly, the no hair. Right? Whatever you throw in, a chicken, a bus, the black hole basically looks the same except it's bigger. And you couldn't tell whether you threw in a bus and a chicken or 300 chickens. Right? Um, whatever else you happen to throw in, <laughs> it's the same. There's no knowledge of, uh, or a record of what went in. Now, it's mathematically interesting, but there's an important consequence we'll come to in a minute. The next thing Stephen showed is that black holes are hot. Um, black holes showed some of the, uh, sorry, black holes didn't show anything. Stephen showed that um, some of the maths with black holes looked a bit like the maths associated to hot objects or thermodynamics. And he thought this was obviously just a, a sort of curiosity. It couldn't really have any meaning because nothing can come out of a black hole. And if you've got a hot object, heat comes out. That's the whole point. Radiation, temperature, you know, the, the object uh, emits stuff at a, at a given temperature. So black holes couldn't be hot. In fact, there was a, a famous scientist called uh, Jacob Beckenstein who died recently, unfortunately. Who, uh, who then took, ran with the analogy and said, well, supposing they really are hot, what are some of the consequences? And I think Stephen was rather dismissive of this and said, well, they, you know, they're obviously not hot. Nothing can come out. And in, he sort of, I think, partly driven by this uh, annoyance, tried to prove it and, in fact, landed up in 1974 proving exactly the reverse, that actually black holes really are hot and stuff does come out of them. Heat does come out of them. So how does that work? This is his, his sort of big discovery. What Stephen did, he was one of these pioneers of trying to combine black holes and gravity with quantum mechanics, this very tricky problem of combining the two. We describe uh, quantum uh, uh, particles using quantum mechanics. That's the language to describe them. And actually, a particle, if you learned at school, a particle is like a little point moving around. Uh, according to Newton, that's reasonable, but in detail, it doesn't get stuff right. And if you want to understand what happens at particle colliders, you really have to use quantum mechanics where we describe particles as fluctuations in a field. And the field permeates all of space. And we think of the particle as a little disturbance in the field that travels along, a little packet of energy. Like the electromagnetic field that I'm sure you've heard of, the particle, the fluctuation, is called the photon associated to that. Now, the one of the interesting things about these fields is that even when there's no particles in them, quantum mechanics makes the field rather complicated. The uncertainty principle you may have heard about basically says you can never be certain about anything. So if you want to say something like, this field is doing nothing, you can't really make that statement because there's always some uncertainty. Things are always doing something. This is a sort of depiction, say, of the electromagnetic field. There's no particles in it, but it's sort of 
fluctuating around because of this quantum mechanics. This would be what a particle looks like, like a photon traveling through. But even when the particle isn't there, the field's still doing stuff. If you put a lot of particles together, you can create a wave, like an electromagnetic wave, radio wave, a microwave, the sort of thing that they detect here in, in Jodrell Bank. But again, even without the particles or the waves, you've still got fluctuations. In fact, these fluctuations have physics associated to them. If you put an object into a, a, a field, a quantum field, it affects it. Here, we've put two metal plates into the electromagnetic field. And what this should depict is that the, the fluctuations are a bit less near the metal plate. So you might think, OK, fine. But actually, that causes a physical effect. It actually causes the plates to attract each other. This was discovered in the 50s by Casimir, and it's called the Casimir effect. And it's nothing to do, these plates don't carry any charge. There's no electric fields or magnetic fields. This is a purely quantum force. And what Stephen did was to say, how does a black hole affect the quantum vacuum? If you put a black hole into space, what does it do? And he did a really remarkable calculation, a very t a tough calculation, and he got it absolutely correct. And people have argued about it for decades after, but there is really no problem with this calculation. It's a, it's a beautiful paper. And what he showed was that if you form, you start with vacuum, you form a black hole, the black hole's then sitting there, it disturbs the vacuum, but it does it in a very particular way. It sends out ripples, if you like, in this vacuum, which to someone far away looks like radiation and particles coming out of the black hole. You didn't put any particles in, but the, the black hole sits there and emits particles and, and energy. And in fact, when you do the calculation, that looks exactly like a hot object emits radiation. So this is his Hawking radiation. It's thermal radiation. And he showed that even though stuff normally you would think of as only being able to fall into a black hole, quantum mechanically, actually, energy comes out in the form of heat. Because black holes have this no hair property, the radiation coming out gives you no information about what had fallen in. It's the same for any black hole, independent of what made it. This formula is his temperature for a black hole. Unfortunately, if you take a star like the sun, turn it into a black hole, the temperature will be, any guesses, in fact, a guess? A million degrees, a thousand degrees? It's a 10 millionth of a degree above absolute zero. And that's why Stephen never got a Nobel Prize, because it's practically impossible to measure currently this tiny temperature. A consequence is you form your black hole, it gives out all this energy, it will make it shrink. It's losing energy. It must shrink, and then in the end, it disappears. And so Stephen's key observation was then, well, where did the information go about what fell into it? If you burn a book, it makes radiation hot gas. But if you could measure that really carefully, you could put it into a big computer and then figure out what was written on the pages of the book. The information's still there, just changed and encoded in a very complicated way. The point with a black hole is the energy comes out carrying no information. And so it really does seem information's gone. And that's the paradox, because quantum mechanics tells you the one thing you can't do is destroy information. So what Stephen showed is that by thinking about quantum mechanics of matter, you led to a paradox with quantum mechanics itself. That's his information loss paradox. It's the resolution for this is that we didn't treat space and time properly and quantum mechanically in this, only the matter. And so the idea is that in this theory of everything, where we can properly make space time quantum mechanical, it will resolve this paradox. Either information really is lost, or it's somehow released in a way that we don't understand through the quantum behavior of space time. But the fact this paradox is the only stepping stone we have to a sort of theory of everything. That is probably the reason I imagine that Stephen will be remembered in hundreds of years' time when hopefully we have this theory of everything. They'll say, ah, and the only clue they had to get it was uh, this information paradox. So I think that's enough about black holes. And I think Richard's now going to tell us 
about the Big Bang cosmology. So, um, so Toby actually alluded to the, to the basic point that I'm going to talk about, which is that he said that uh, a black hole, black hole in reverse is, is, is the Big Bang. Uh, so let, let's go back uh, to the 1960s, which is when Stephen did this. So this was actually, the, 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 the thing that I'm going to talk about is actually the eureka moment that he was having in the film The Theory of Everything at that time. The stuff that uh, Toby has just talked about actually happened in the 1970s. The, the, the clip was set in the 1960s, and there were two ideas for the evolution of the universe. So one was a, a so-called evolutionary theory, and the other one was what's known as the steady state theory. And now, I, I'm just looking around the audience, and I can't see that many people who were around in the 1960s, but uh, perhaps a, a, a few. Uh, there were actually a whole series of TV programs on, uh, on British television at that time uh, debating these, uh, the, these ideas. And in fact, Bernard Lovell, who was the, the director of Jodrell Bank and the, the founder of Jodrell Bank, was invo involved in this, uh, this discussion. And they involved... Um, uh, another guy, uh, a very another famous scientist called uh, Fred Hoyle, who was the proponent of the, the the steady state theory, and they were both motivated by the idea that the universe is expanding. So, w my guess is that you've all heard that the universe is expanding. Is is that is that correct? Okay. Well, you. Um, so these are the observations that are done in the 1920s uh, of the. The, all galaxies appear to be moving away from us. Okay, uh, so, oops, I've done that wrong. Uh, on, is, which one's the? Uh, it's the red button, isn't it? Is, uh, there, there isn't a there isn't a pointer. But on on the on the uh, on on this axis of this graph here, there is a velocity, and this is distance along the bottom. And what people found was that except for very close by here, that the, uh, all the galaxies were moving away from us. And this, uh, people concluded on the basis of that that we, we were living in an expanding universe. Now, the steady state theory, which happens to be incorrect, was, uh, was suggested by uh, this other famous scientist, Fred Hoyle. And the, the, the basic idea of that is that although the universe expands, so this is what this picture is trying to show here, is there's some, some expansion going on, the, the density remains constant, so the, the spacing between those dots, which are meant to uh, signify particles, is about the same uh, as time goes on. The, the evolutionary theory ideas uh, can be sort of... Uh, th this picture here is, is an analogy. So the idea there is that there are some squares in the universe which are like a grid system, like a piece of graph paper that... Uh, we used to designate where all the particles are, and that 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 set of particles, uh, so so that that set of uh, squares gets bigger as time goes on, and a, this is uh, an expanding solution of uh, general relativity, the theory that uh, Toby mentioned, which uh, has black holes in it, which were discovered actually in the 1920s and 1930s by uh, a whole group of people: uh, Friedman, Robertson, uh, Lemaitre, uh, and, and and Walker. And this, um, uh, this evolutionary idea has, a, as a consequence of it, the idea of a Big Bang. And that Big Bang comes when the squares get smaller and smaller. So as you go back in time, the, s the squares get smaller and smaller. And zero size squares is the time of the Big Bang. And in fact, Fred Hoyle, who was very much against this idea, who's a sort of grumpy... Uh, Yorkshireman, which I think I can say that, seen as I am one myself, um, uh, he he uh, used it as a pejorative description of this idea. He didn't like it basically, and he liked his own idea, which I think, with the benefit of hindsight, was a bit silly, because it, it required the the constant creation of a whole load of matter to remain uh, for the for the universe to remain at a constant density. But this Big Bang theory has this. Very, very strange idea of a singularity and a, a point of infinite density at some early stage in the universe where the temperature becomes infinite and the physics breaks down. Just 
as what happens in a black hole. And that is essentially what um, uh, he was thinking about during that talk about, uh, by, uh, by uh, Roger Penrose, who developed all these ideas about black hole. He was having that eureka moment saying, what if I apply these ideas to the evolution of the universe? So here's a, here's a sort of picture to just to sort of contrast the two ideas. So the, the Big Bang evolutionary theory is on the, on the top here, where essentially the, 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 square, uh, the, the dots sorry, are, getting, are getting further apart. The density of dots is going down. So the density in this particular is the number of dots divided by the area. In this one, it's, it's remaining constant. So there were these two big ideas around. So what is a, what is a singularity? So I, I thought I'd, I, I, I'd risk it and put one uh, equation in my, in my talk, but hopefully you can understand the concept of a singularity. So uh, a, a function f is equal to x, that is a function that has no singularity. Because if I give you a number x, you can work out what f is at every point, in, every, every point in space. Whereas if I take f is 1 divided by x, then there's actually a singularity at x equals 0. And that is, I, you, we cannot calculate the value of f at, uh, uh, at 0. And that is depicted in this picture here, which is actually a, a, a picture of one, 1 over x. At x equals 0, the blue curve has just gone uh, haywire. So the idea of a singularity is that that happens in space, it happens in the center of a black hole, and it, if, if the Big Bang is true, it happens as we go back in time, and it happened at the moment uh, of, of creation. So Penrose was talking about this idea, if you remember in the, back to the clip, he was talking about circles getting smaller and smaller, and this is my uh, uh, picture of what he was talking about. So he was talking about the idea of a star which was in what we call hydrostatic equilibrium. That means that the energy that was, the pressure that was pushing outwards from the sun essentially exploding um, and, 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 and uh, emitting light is balanced by the, uh, the gravitational force. Eventually, all stars will run out of fuel. Our, our own will run out in about four billion years, so don't, don't worry about it, but uh, eventually it will run out and some complicated process happens, but ultimately what will happen is that, that, that force that's pushing outwards, the, the, the explosions that are happening within the, the sun, will, will run out, they will no longer be happening, and gravity will take over, and it will shrink and shrink and shrink. And eventually it will reach this event horizon and, uh, uh, and create a black hole, if it's big enough. Now, what Penrose, I mean, hopefully that picture is, is rather obvious. If you imagine something that has nothing, you know, a, a, a football that has nothing holding it up, there's no air inside, it, 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 it contracts down. And the idea of that happening in a spherical picture or in a circular picture here on my, on my slides, hopefully is, is quite uh, obvious. What Penrose was actually talking about was, he was talking about the fact that this will always happen, even if these circles have waves on them, or, or if, they're, if they're not exactly circular. No matter what is going on in that star, no matter how inhomogeneous everything is around that star, it will, it will collapse down into a black hole. So that was what Penrose was, was talking about. And what Stephen showed is that these evolutionary ideas, these ideas where you have uh, the expanding squares, okay, now here is, what do I do, I click it. So on, on, on the right-hand side is a, a set of squares which are going to go backwards in time. They've got, they've got a whole load of matter in them now. So this is a picture of the universe today. And they're going to go back in time, these, these squares, and back to, in this case, something that's perfectly smooth. And in that case, got a whole load of what we call inhomogeneities in it. It's, it's not smooth. And what Stephen showed was that even in that case over there, you will go to a big bang. This one, perhaps it's rather obvious, the idea of the squares getting smaller, but even if the squares are not exactly square, they're, they're distorted in some way, they will go back to uh, um, a, um, uh, this, this big bang singularity. So the singularity 
that we see at the Big Bang is a generic feature of these ideas, in the same way as, uh, uh, as Toby mentioned for black holes. So that was what he was talking about then. So historically, that was the first thing, the first really big discovery that he made. And then he went on to talk about the uh, connecting quantum mechanics and uh, general relativity in the way that Toby uh, discussed. We now have this modern view of cosmology, of the universe expanding in this way so that uh, it, it comes from some initial state here and it gets to the point where we, we, we can detect it now, all manner of stars and, and things going on. At the beginning of time, we believe that there is a period of what's called inflation takes place and this is some ultra fast expansion of, of the universe. And it explains why the universe is so big, so smooth, but it also can explain how this apparently very homogeneous universe can turn into the universe that we see today, which is populated by stars and galaxies with very little between them. So this is done by this process of gravitational collapse, which is... Uh, uh, th these are pictures. So this is at an early time of the universe. This is the sort of computer simulations of what happens. This is a very early time of the universe. That is the late time of the universe. And time is going across here, across here, and across here. And what you see is that gravity, initial uh, waves in the universe, which are in this picture in the uh, top left-hand corner, they collapse in under gravity and form the galaxies and other structures in the universe that we see today. But somehow you had to create some, some fluctuations in the beginning. Uh, and what, what Stephen did, and he was one of the first people to do that, was to calculate the nature of these uh, initial fluctuations which led to galaxy formation. And the reason why that is rela it's related to the, to the calculation uh, for black holes, where he calculated the temperature of the black hole. In fact, the space-time associated with this uh, inflationary epoch also has a temperature. And that's what this picture is going to try and signify, which Toby made. Uh, so it's, it's a sort of adaptation of the, it, 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 of, the, of the pictures that we showed before. So there's all these sort of fluctuations going on in the background of space-time, and eventually they freeze in and after 13 billion years all ultimately the, 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 so those, those uh, fluctuations uh, are give you this and eventually as time evolves over 13 billion years they give you, uh, give you that. So Stephen applied these ideas, uh, and it's all to do with the same, the same physics as for black holes. He applied these, um, these ideas, and, um, uh, and, and that led to um, uh, the formation of galaxies. So he's, he's also one of the first people to do that calculation. So the final thing we're going to talk about is a very speculative idea that he came up with. Uh, also with, with, a, with another famous scientist called James Hartle. Um, it's called the Hartle-Hawking no-boundary proposal. And the idea there was, so we've got this, we have to try and explain what's going on at this Big Bang singularity. And he came up with some ideas, uh, was the idea of making a universe from nothing. Okay, And if you actually, um, I think historically this, this, this idea is, Relate, is, is partially blamed in a lot of books for his, uh, 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 some of the disagreements that he had with his, his wife, although I don't want to... Uh, uh, because, because it basically got away with the idea of there being a, a creator with, with, uh, and, and, and clash with religious beliefs. So the idea there is that in the early stages of the universe, one can think of the space and time as uh, being actually not separate things, but there being some imaginary time, and in that space there being uh, what we call, uh, the, the, the surface here has no boundary at this bottom. Rather than just going down into a spike, there is no, no boundary. So that was um, one of the sort of uh, 
ideas that led on uh, from, from all these ideas. So initially, he applied classical physics to the Big Bang, found the idea of the singularity. He, he learns about black holes and quantum mechanics. He applied that to the inflationary epoch and then started to uh, pontificate about what might have happened even before that, that, that inflationary epoch. So I think um, this is the conclusion. I, I, I think perhaps Toby was supposed to say this because it's in black. Uh, it, the, we, 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 I'm white and black, and he's black and white. Um, but anyway, I, I, I think I will say it to save uh, Toby from getting up. But um, of course, Stephen was uh, quite an extraordinary person in so many ways. His life uh, was one of the great human stories. His fight against disability um, uh, transcended anything that he did in science, but he was also a scientist who ranks alongside the very, very, very best of his generation. And I think some of his ideas that he came up with in the 1960s to 1980s revolutionized uh, our understanding of black holes, cosmology, and did give us the biggest clue that we have so far towards uh, what is the theory of everything, that somehow we can connect uh, uh, quantum mechanics and general relativity. And his body's work of a scientist, not just as a popularizer of science and as a, a public figure, will be remembered by physicists uh, for, for years to come. So thank you. So we've got time for five minutes of questions, so yeah. if anybody has any. There's a question down here. So earlier you were talking about black holes and how people assumed they didn't have any heat um, because obviously everything went in and nothing came out. Um, did this mean that they believed that black holes were absolute zero? Shall I? Uh, yep. This is on, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, before Stephen's calculation came along, they thought black holes were absolute zero. There was no temperature, nothing could come out. It was a one-way ticket. Everything, if it went in, it went in, nothing could come out. And, and what Stephen showed exactly was that that's not quite true. There's this, if provided you treat the matter fields outside a black hole properly using quantum mechanics, Basically, because of this uncertainty, it's like saying, can you be certain nothing comes out? Well, actually, no. In quantum mechanics, you can't be certain of anything. And so some stuff does come out. It's a tiny amount. As we said, for the, I did this, <laughs> this calculation the other day. I've never done it before. So it's always great giving a public talk, because you know, mostly you know, doing a science and getting on with it. But then you have to think <laughs> about things. And I thought, so the temperature of a black hole that's the size of a sun is about is less than a tenth of a millionth of a degree above absolute zero. So it's actually colder than the universe today. So in fact, in our real universe, black holes aren't evaporating energy. They're absorbing it from the universe around. However, in, in an ideal situation where there was nothing around, it would evaporate. The power given off by a black hole, the mass of the sun with that temperature, I was thinking, well, maybe it's the power in a kettle. It's actually much less than the power of a bacteria due to its metabolism. So it's about a billion times less than the power generated by a single bacterium. So the time it takes to dissipate the energy and evaporate a black hole is way, way longer than the lifetime of the universe. Otherwise, Stephen really would have had a Nobel Prize by now, and we'd have seen it. And sadly, however significant the discovery was, the, the rules of the Nobel Prize game are that you've got to have detected it. So we've got time for one more question. Um, so if there's uh, in the opposite of, are you embarrassed, Jens? <laughs> <laughs> So, say there's the opposite of a black hole, say a white hole, um, would it um, be the opposite of temperature-wise in hockey, um, and radiation-wise, too? Like, instead of being that little amount of 
uh, radiation given off? Would it be more or less? I mean, <laughs> firstly, congratulations on embarrassing your, your dad. Brilliant. I thought it was supposed to be the other way around, but <laughs> I managed to embarrass my daughter, so well done. Uh, you're absolutely right. White holes are the opposite of a black hole. So in a black hole, stuff only falls in. Mm -hmm. In a white hole, stuff only falls out. And so they're a sort of catastrophically bad object because even excluding quantum mechanics, stuff just pours out of them. Elephants, giraffes, the whole lot. And so people believe they're so horrible that they can't really be there in the universe. They can't physically be realized. And in fact, um, one of the things about black holes, things like white holes, also wormholes you may have heard about, wormholes maybe allowing us to travel all you know, across the universe in milliseconds by sort of a, a shortcut. All of those things, they're, they're sort of solutions of Einstein's equations, but it's not believed they can be physically formed. So whereas with Penrose's theorems, we know that generically you take certain types of stars that are big enough, they collapse, you form black holes, and that's for sure, there's no theorem the other way around that says white holes can exist. And in fact, we don't know of any way to form a white hole. It sort of had to be there at the beginning, and if it's not there at the beginning, you, don't, you can't make it. And the same with wormholes, sadly, because wormholes, I'm sure NASA spends money thinking about wormholes. They spend money thinking about anti-gravity, even though it's clearly an insane thing to think about. But you know, they're probably thinking about wormholes, and I might be wrong, and maybe we'll all travel on wormholes soon. But uh, you know, it's believed that one can't make these things, even though they are solutions of the equations. So with black holes, people were suspicious about them as well, and it was really Penrose's work, and then later work of Stephen and so on, that, that showed you shouldn't be suspicious, you should really believe it. There isn't such a thing for white holes, but yeah, that's so, good questions. Well, I think Charlie's going to bring this, the questions to an end now, but um, while they're setting up for the film, we're happy to yeah, answer any, any further Don't questions, in particular ones that uh, you might not want to ask in public. Um, <laughs> uh, so so we'll, we'll be hanging around here for, 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 for yeah. quarter, uh, 10, 15 minutes if, if anyone wants to come and ask us yeah. uh, any, any other questions. So let's thank Richard and Toby again.